today's World Insights. The third China International Import Expo about to take off. The pandemic reminds us that all countries are a community with a shared future, and no one can stand alone in the face of major crises. How crucial is this year's expo to global recovery amid the COVID-19 surge? And growing opportunities for music and piano sales in the Chinese market, could piano pieces strike a chord with CIIE visitors? The lowdown from Ron Losby, the CEO of the famous American piano maker Steinway and Son. Growth is, is so pronounced in China. Welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Let's begin with the upcoming third China International Import Expo, or known as CIIE. The six-day expo will start on Thursday in Shanghai despite surging COVID-19 cases outside China. Thanks to tight pandemic control measures, China has made the swiftest recovery from the pandemic among major economies so far. In the first three quarters, China's economy grew by 0.7 percent from a year earlier, while the rest of the world is still largely mirrored in recession. The country's total imports and exports also posted positive year-on-year -year growth in the same period. It's expected the third CIIE, by far the world's first import-themed national exhibition, will show China's renewed commitment to rule-based global trade and providing greater market access to foreign firms despite of rising protectionism elsewhere in the world. For more on the latest development on CIIE, I'm joined here in the studio, Greg Gilligan, Chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce, MCHAM in China. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Likewise. It's been a while. And also, Mr. Wei Wen, Senior Fellow from the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies with Renmin University. Mr. He, good to see you as well. Good to see you. It's great. The ongoing CIIE, the Import Expo. This is the third time, as you may know, Mr. Gilligan. And this time, despite of the pandemic, it is going to be in-person exhibition. And even the exhibition area has been expanded even then last year. So how much do you see this enthusiasm in the air still about the Chinese market, particularly from the American business perspective, of course? It's been very direct in that uh, the economy has stood back up quite quickly and we do still have issues where many of our executives are offshore and having trouble getting back. So we need to solve that because for um, foreign multinationals to be able to continue to invest and drive um, business decisions, they need their executives on the ground mm -hmm. along with their families and support workers like educators and healthcare workers, etc. However, um, everybody is encouraged by how quickly the economy's got back on its feet and, you know, recent numbers, whether it's um, um, manufacturing or consumer activity, et cetera, those are all things that we see. We also hear from our members that they are being tasked by their global uh, entities <laughs> to have the China market help carry some of the gap that they're facing in other parts of the world. Just to follow up about what you said about the executives and their families, uh, uh, the pandemic situation in the U.S. unfortunately is getting ever more worrisome. Yes. So that also puts some hindrance about what we can do together, isn't it? That's a very fair statement. Um, it's just the reality that the global pandemic in other parts of the world is not going in the right direction. And so naturally, uh, governments will be conservative about how they open or do not open their borders. Um, but, you know, everything's a balance because um, people need health and safety uh, and society needs an economy to support it. Mm. So it's a balancing act. It is a balancing act, and the balancing act has very much been the focal point for China's 14th five-year plan. There's a lot to balance about, and a higher quality of opening up, but at the same time speed up the reform. Uh, Mr. He, how is the CIIE, in your view, uh, can reflect kind of ambition and aspiration? I think uh, CIIE, by name, means 
import exposition. That's right. But actually, CIE has more meaning than that. That means it shows that China is ready and it has been and it will continue to open up to the whole world. And not only open up for imports, some say apples or uh, uh, foods, and that's not that. The best technologies, resources, and uh, technology from the world to support China's high grade development. Mm. Without the high standard opening up, it would not have been possible to attain the high, medium high quality development. Well, therefore, it comes to the tricky part, isn't it? Technology. Uh, it is no secret that uh, between China and the United States, there is a somewhat technological competition. So, Mr. Gilligan, many of your members actually are in the field or related to the field on the supply chain. So, what do you make about that kind of aspiration coming from China? The realities inside the United States, especially when we observe the latest development of the relation result, uh, to match the two, can, can there still be match anymore? As business people, we also track geopolitics, mostly so that we can stay out of them. Um, but Good point. in that context, uh, in order for us to uh, drive commerce in the way that we hope to, we observe what's going on. And it's quite simple that much of that is outside of our lane. So we stay in our commercial lane and then we try to ask the respective governments to keep the concerns of um, national security and law enforcement as narrow as is appropriate and broaden the commercial lane as much as possible. Mm. So we don't want each to use um, excuses to limit the commercial opportunity of the other. We all know that this is a difficult time in the U.S.-China relationship and we advocate against decoupling mm. uh, as do our members because what we do is good for the American people and the Chinese people. So American business being in China is a good thing and we work very hard to try to demonstrate that. There's ways that we can focus on areas uh, where we may be able to cooperate as opposed to trying to break down the barriers of those more contentious areas. Um, you know, in the famous words of uh, Zhou Enlai, it was to seek um, commonalities and, and put aside differences. Mm, set aside the differences and seek common ground, as Mr. Mm -hmm. Zhou said. Uh, Mr. He, is there much common ground? And can differences be put aside, uh, especially when you look at the election and the likely up of four years? Uh, we don't know the result of the election. Uh, however, if we look forward to the next four years, I'm confident that the bilateral trade relations will improve from the worst state situation. Uh, you think we already reached the bottom line there, uh, uh, even I though some so. analysts uh, believe uh, the uh, other way around? Uh, it's uh, different. Just, uh, I just say uh, regarding the bilateral trade, we see uh, we have already seen a pickup in the bilateral trade for the next first nine months of this year. Mm. China's exports already was picking up fast in the single months. July, August, September, the monthly Chinese export in, in dollar terms exceeded monthly average of 2018, the highest in history. While imports from the United States has also been increasing for the first nine months. We, the imports from the United States increased by 2.8 percent year on year, while Chinese imports from the worldwide is still in negative ground. So that means both countries are working towards the bilateral trade. Having said that, though, we did notice, uh, for example, in the high area, uh, the bans on Chinese uh, on exporting to China and providing certain important components uh, through the uh, supply chain by the U.S. side has been, in fact, exercised through executive order. Now, we do not know the result of this election, and we do not know, even for the same person, the policies of the first four years, will they likely continue for the second term? Now, we don't know about that. And of course, if it's a different president, whether the policy will be similar in logic or very different in logic, we don't know either. But it does leave 
the executive order, only the use of it. Some rooms for maneuvering, some suggest. Now, Mr. Gilligan, do you see that as a possibility? How big a possibility is that? Do you see much room for maneuvering from the U.S. policymakers' perspective regarding their approach to China? It's clearly been the case because we've seen the use of executive orders um, fairly frequently in this recent period of time. The nature of the American system, however, is one of a separation of powers from um, the executive okay. branch, the judiciary, and the legislature. And so uh, when you see the executive branch using uh, e these executive orders in this way, there is still always the possibility of review by the judicial branch and or newly legislated boundaries by the legislature. We see some ups and downs over the past few years, haven't we, that uh, we have been suggesting China-U.S. trade uh, relations has been the pillar of the relations and stabilizing factor. And then we see some turbulence, uh, particularly complaints from the American business community, some of your members as well, about uh, China's opening up policy, about this and that. And that also have an impact on the lobbying in Washington toward the current White House, one could argue. Mm -hmm. And now we also see, once again, another term, that the American business community here in China, at least, that, that I've been talking to, are seeing you know, the current stage is certainly not the way to go. They want to come back to negotiation and discussion, and not necessarily cutting off and decoupling. So, Mr. Hu, what does that mean uh, for China to adjust mm -hmm. and to uh, bring the best possibility when it comes to partnership and work on policies if possible? I think the best uh, way, or one of the best, uh, the good ways for the Chinese government is to approach the American business community to listen attentively to their complaints, their needs, their requirements, and they judge. And also we hope that the American business provides more fact-based complaints and the requirements <laughs> so we can work together to find out what really we should improve. Mm. So many of the complaints are reasonable. We should do something towards that direction. If we say we have been doing pretty well, what is the, then what is the point of further opening up mm. to further reform? That means we have problems. We, in this respect, regard, we should work closely with the American business community. Of course, they also complain with the American government, with the U.S. government. For instance, the U.S. CBC uh, sent a report, the USTR complained about a compulsory transfer of technology, and that was used in the 301 investigation report. However, they were firmly against the tariffs. So, it's complicated. We should work carefully with the business community. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mr. Gilligan, I'm sure you know much better about this exacting trend than what I just illustrated. I think there's a, an interesting way to think about this problem. I describe it as a bit of a time warp. Mm. Explain, um, please. Sure. It's, you know, we all know about jet lag where you, if you fly for 14 hours to go from China to the U.S., you experience some jet lag. I'm not talking about a gap of hours. I'm referring to a gap of years. And so for those of us who live in China, work here, have so many relationships with Chinese friends and family, uh, we have maybe a different boots on the ground perspective about what is happening and what is likely to happen uh, going forward. Mm. Whereas in the Beltway in D.C., Washington, D.C., their understanding of China maybe is rooted in two or three or four years ago. And it takes a while for them to catch up. Go so six, seven years ago, and I was chair at a different point in time for AmCham China, mm -hmm. uh, I was in Washington saying, you need to get tougher on China because they'll respect that. We'll, bring, we'll come together in a way where... Um, more parity of opportunity and people said oh that's you know we we don't believe in that and reciprocity is not in our vocabulary and so forth and now that's all they talk about we advocated for it got criticized for it and now we're advocating saying look we need to take a step back 
we need to find these common areas. We need to think about how we can work together. And then what we do is we provide some ideas on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Will there be decoupling, though? Even though we talk about the confidence in the China market, will American businesses have to think about two ways of doing things? One is in China, the other is in the rest of the world. And so uh, do the Chinese businesses have to worry about doing what they're doing in China and going to the United States totally different from the rest of the world. Uh, Mr. Ho, maybe I go to you first and then Mr. Gilligan. Uh, as far as decoupling is concerned, I think individual shift of the investment of facilities or uh, technology restrictions are always there. Mm. We don't worry too much about that. We, what we should pay attention is the general trend. In general trend of decoupling between China and U.S. business is impossible because we can classify generally into three different categories. Mm -hmm. First, the military use, the always decoupled. We have had uh, Hong Kong, Paris first, and then Athena arrangement and later on is decoupled. However, China's technology in this area is still growing. And the second category, ordinary products. So the two-way trade is still growing, as I mentioned earlier, that of the, I believe that bilateral U.S.-China trade, according to China statistics, will top historical high by 2021. And also, then the third category, the high tech, especially semiconductor chips or the 5Gs, uh, they will be very difficult. They will harm both China and the U.S. But in the end, they will not be successful. For instance, we say that China accounts for 18% of the world market for semiconductors offered by the United States. If the total ban on China, exporting to China, the United States will lose the 18% share, then the, the world market share will lose fall from current 48% to 30%. Then the United States will be no longer the world's largest supplier, maybe Korea or China. So Mr. Gilligan, what's your response to what Mr. Ho just said? Well, I'll address that, but I want to answer your question first. And so uh, could there be decoupling? Of course there could. Um, should there be? In our view, no. And all we need to do as business people, it's pretty simple for us, we just need to, need to meet the compliance requirements of the countries where we operate. So in this case, the U.S. and China. And then we don't need to worry about the um, governance aspect of it because we've met the letter of the law, therefore we can go forward. Now recognizing the relationship's in a bad place right now and there's a lot of sensitive areas including tech and other places where it'd be harder for us to get support from either side to say, hey, we want to do something in, you know, uh, well, I won't name the sectors, but there are several, uh, whereas, if we focus on areas that are less contentious, and I'll say areas like public health, uh, global wellness, um, environmental protection, mm. these are areas where there should be broader agreement that what we do together is good for the whole world. So what we're trying to do, and I've been working with some of um, um, Chinese specialists on this side, and particularly mm -hmm. in public health, we're trying to do is to create a platform that would allow Chinese enterprise and U.S. enterprise to come together, do research and development, product development, and then also some um, social impact initiatives, which is sort of another word for corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And maybe along the way, we can bring small and medium-sized enterprises onto that platform as well to help drive the economy. So we're looking to focus on areas where we can agree not the ones we can't. Now, from now until the January the 20th, there will be a lot of uncertainties. I'm not saying after that there would not be or less, but uh, that's at least in the foreseeable future. So how do you think that both sides uh, uh, should interact with one another for the remaining of the year until uh, the event of the United States, another term or a new one comes into the office, Mr. Gilligan? Well, I certainly hope that we build on the strength of the relationship that Vice Premier Liu He has with um, Ambassador Lighthizer and Secretary Mnuchin. 
So one of the best things that we can do would be to make sure that the phase one trade deal is a success. That way both sides can credibly represent to their own interests that things are happening in the best possible way. That then sets up the conversation for necessary structural reform that would fall into more of a phase two category of a trade deal. So whether it's market access, intellectual property protection, mm. um, technology transfer, et cetera. So continue down that path, set up a foundation so that the uh, second uh, version of the administration or a new administration can then build from there. Mm. Mr. He, for China, it's a different story. We do always say the geopolitics. Now we say geo-trade. Geo-trade, the largest partner for China in global trade is Asia. Asia accounts for 51% of China's total trade. Of course, ASEAN is the largest uh, group. Mm -hmm. And also we have Japan, South Korea, yeah. and many other Asian countries. And then Europe accounts for 19%. And North America accounts now for only 14 to 15 percent. So global-wise, the largest focus of China's trade is Asia. That it, because Asia and Europe is linked in the continent, so Asia and Euro-Asia accounts for 70 percent of China's trade. Mm -hmm. That's formidable. And uh, of course, this does not mean that the United States is not important. Uh, but Country-wise, the United States is still the largest trade partner of China. Mm. And uh, because of the weight of the U.S. in the world economy and in the world order, we should lose no efforts to try to solidify, maintain relations, sound relations, or try as sound as possible with the U.S. You know, we used to talk about the world order. Uh, we talk about geopolitics, uh, you know, nation-to-nation -nation relations. But now it's much more complex than just the relation between the countries. How should we jump out of this earlier old frame uh, that has made the Cold War the case and be able to focus on the real possibilities? Not to mention the fourth industrial revolution is already with us. So uh, I'm sure you have your thoughts from different perspectives. Help us to entice it, please. I'll come back to what we do, which is, we think, the foundation of U.S.-China relations. Mm. And when we do things together that demonstrate to both sides um, the benefits to each society of our business activity, we'll get support. Now, the frameworks that go around that in order to allow uh, or regulate activity mm -hmm. uh, are going to evolve and we just need to evolve with them. So um, I'll just say whether it's the global wellness, environmental protection, those kinds of things that we need to continue to go forward, demonstrate success. And then uh, of course multilateralism is great. We should all have a voice. We should all be able to mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about what's necessary for global benefit, but there's no getting around the fact that mm -hmm. global benefit is largely hinged on the success of the U.S.-China relationship. Mm. Mr. Hu? Yes, and uh, there have been sayings about uh, the possible Cold War between China and the United States, and uh, some compared it to the previous Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, but the two things are totally incomparable because we just say mentioned the economic base. At that time, there was a minimal trade between U.S. and the Soviet Union sure. because Soviet Union has a separate market structure within its neighboring countries mm. and uh, very little in the free trade, in convertible currency trade with the West, including the United States. But today, China is uh, in a total different situation because of sound and extensive economic relations and uh, also strong links in the global supply chain, making it very difficult to couple, to have the curtain drawing down between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Imaginable. We can a very simple example. Germany and France fighting each other for centuries, but after World War, 
the Robert Schuman, the French foreign minister, proposed the plan, Schuman plan, to build up the community for the Europe. So they connect each other, invest in each other, and they form the common market, making it impossible to fight each other. And you're watching World Insights, still to come on our program today. Growing enthusiasm for Western classical music in China leads to good opportunities for piano sales in the Chinese market. Could piano pieces strike a chord with CIIE visitors? On that, I talked to Ron Rossi, CEO of the American piano maker Steinway and Sons. Stay tuned. The reason that the growth is so pronounced in China. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Deeper pockets and a newfound focus on well-being are fueling lifestyle changes among many Chinese, a transition that is absolutely music to the ears of piano makers. More and more Chinese are studying music, including learning the piano. This spells a business boom for companies like Steinway and Sons amid sluggish sales worldwide. The company took part in the last two CIIEs, and this year they're coming again. I got a chance to talk with Ron Lousby, president and CEO of Steinway and Sons, on the significance of the CIIE and business opportunities from a nation hungry for music. And I'm happy to be joined by Ron Lousby, who is the president and CEO of Steinway and Sons. What a pleasure, Mr. Lousby, to see you. It is my pleasure to be here. Good morning. Good morning to you, and probably I should say good evening as well. Uh, yeah. Tell me more yeah. about how do you consider the importance of the Chinese market for Steinway throughout history, and particularly now? Well, I have to say that the Chinese market for really the last uh, 20 years has been the primary growth market uh, for Steinway and Sons and other piano manufacturers. Uh, it is one of the few markets that in terms of actual unit sales of Steinway pianos, is growing year on year. And we've seen, of course, our business uh, growing year on year. And I believe that the reason that the growth is, is so pronounced in China is that the average uh, consumer understands the importance of music education for their children. And this is, has fueled a purchasing of many pianos, but including our pianos. And we believe it will continue unabated for quite some time. If we look at Europe and North America, those are what we call mature markets, and they're basically very stable in terms of the number of pianos that are, are purchased by consumers. But China, I'm very pleased to say, because of this reverence for music education, is growing, and we intend to grow along with it. Mr. Lossby, many believe education is the key for communications, and it's also the key for uh, the world to work together for the longer term. Uh, when it comes to music education, how do you think classical music, particularly Western classical music, has been transforming you know, China's understanding, Chinese children and their families' understanding about what's going on in the rest of the world? Well, music does bring us all together, and it's a language that if we don't speak the same common language that we speak in our, from our tongues, music is something we can all understand because it is international. And I believe that the, the love of Western music that has come out of the uh, people of China, uh, I think it's so universal, it almost doesn't matter where the music comes from because classical music just speaks to each of us individually and expresses emotions uh, in a musical format that every human being can relate to. Mm. And, you know, I'm really pleased to say, too, that, that the study of music is something, classical music, is something that actually creates skills that can be transferred to other areas in one's life, whether it be medicine or business or virtually anything, because it provides discipline, self-confidence, you're learning a new language, you're starting a project, a piece of music, and, and you're not going to stop learning that until you finish it. So it also creates an attention span that frankly is lacking in, in, in many individuals that don't have that discipline. Mm. Well, Mr. Losby, as you may know very well that uh, even China-U.S. Uh, relations uh, uh, in the past few decades once was uh, building the bridge uh, through music uh, because of uh, some of the symphony orchestra's visits to China and that certainly has opened the door for communications. Having said that though, uh, 
you have a lot of showrooms in China. I've been going to some of these showrooms, and I saw Chinese uh, parents uh, leading their children, wandering around, uh, you know, head over heels in love with the piano, the one that's almost uh, right behind you right now. So uh, I'm sure that is a very promising market. How do you think the combine of uh, communication and also music can be together, together with education as well, to make this uh, cooperation, this potential, ever bigger? Well, music is a bridge, as you say. It's a bridge between peoples, and in this day and time, so many great artists are coming from China. Let's take Long Long for an example. Mm -hmm. He concertizes all over the world. Yu Di Li, uh, Yu Jia Wang, they concentrate. They concertize everywhere, and, and they're great ambassadors, not just for music, but also for for China. And when they come over here, they play this great music, and they're ambassadors for your wonderful country. It brings all of our peoples together, whether you're European or South American or North American, and it builds this wonderful bridge through communication, through music. And I believe that that is what has basically opened up a dialogue between many Chinese, many Americans, many Europeans, because it's a language that all of us can understand. Mm. And I know that uh, you are also going to the Import Expo in Shanghai, even though there's uh, difficulty to travel for you personally, but your company is going to be there, your staff is going to be there, you are going to have some wonderful show for all of the audience going to the Expo. Tell me more about it. Well, this is really a very important forum for us. And yes, this year it may be diminished somewhat, but we felt as a company it was important to be represented there because there will be people, not just from China, but from other countries that come to this show. And I think it's important that Steinway and many other musical instrument companies display during this time because music is one of the few things that really can bring everybody closer together, even when we're distant because of this uh, pandemic. So we felt from a commercial standpoint that it was really very important, but also from an emotional standpoint, just to say that, you know, we are in a different world right now temporarily, but we're not going to let it affect us in such a way that we just do, you know, contract everything. So we feel that this exposure is extremely important for Steinway, as well as the other companies that are also displaying their products. Mm. When music of, is flowing in the air, I guess the, the pain of the pandemic is uh, fading away. Having said that, though, uh, Mr. Losby, we are all optimistic persons, but we have to face the reality. The pandemic it does have a dumping effect on the industry, on the performing arts, and many other areas. How do you see the immediate challenge as a result of this? Well, the, the very real challenge in most parts of the world is that the concert venues where we have live performance are just not uh, open, no. they're not available for live performance, mm. and that is indeed a pity because there's nothing that will replace a live performance. That being said, though, our, our industry has become very creative, Steinway has become very creative in sending music via the internet in various different forms right into someone's home or right into a school that keeps us all connected. I mean, I was looking at a, a uh, university the other day from Europe that had this incredible concert of all these orchestra members, and they were all in different places, and they, they were all playing an orchestral piece. And frankly, it was quite good and quite interesting, and for a moment I forgot that I wasn't in an audience, that I was sitting at home listening to this. So I think the creativity in taking digital communication to a different level has enabled musicians to at least remain connected to their audiences to a certain degree. But there's no doubt that for the performers that are used to live concerts, it's been devastating for them because they just don't have the opportunity right now. And in some areas where they do, mm. because of the various quarantine rules, they can't go for one night because they're quarantined for 14 days That's once right. they get there, before they get there. Mm. But I do believe that the internet, the digital interface that has been developed by so many creative musicians around the world is something that's going to serve us well long after this pandemic uh, is a distant memory. All right. Uh, tell me about which piece did you listen to when you heard about uh, performance uh, from the European Orchestra? 
It was Ravel's Bolero, and oh. if you're familiar with that piece, I mean, it's one of these instru these great instrumental works that starts out very small and keeps building and building and building yes. to this incredible climax. And all of these wonderful students were coming in at the correct times, and then it was just really an emotional experience for me to think that all of these, these students were in different places around the world, not just in one country, and they were able to create this great musical art that emotionally moved me and I'm sure everyone else who was listening to this. Sounds already exhilarating, even through the description of yours. Uh, I can see the lights in your eyes when you're talking about that <laughs> performance. <laughs> Certainly one who is uh, really in love with music. Having said that, though, um, Mr. Losby, the quality of sound is extremely important uh, for a piano like the one that you are producing, Steinway & Sons. And, the, you know, the color, the, the shining, the, 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 the texture of the everything that's involved in this piano also gives people pleasure as a whole it gives a total image but now of course uh, through internet we will be able to demonstrate some of those but the real sound quality of a concert hall likely to be compromised so how do you see this especially for the very high-end quality of pianos that you produce and you are proud of well, you're right. There's nothing that's going to replace being in the room with the piano that either you're thinking of purchasing or that you wish to play. So it does compromise the experience to a certain amount. But I have to say, it's been very interesting to me that around the world during this pandemic from February to today, we have sold many, many new Steinway Grand pianos and the customers have not even touched the instrument until it arrived at their home. And I've, I've done some, some sort of research by calling these customers here mm -hmm. in North America saying, why would you choose to purchase an expensive instrument mm -hmm. without ever playing it or seeing it personally? And I was so gratified because what they said was the Steinway brand, the Steinway name is synonymous with quality, with craftsmanship and with integrity. And I do know that even if I can't play the piano before it's delivered, that it's going to meet or exceed my expectations. Mm. So very interestingly, we have actually been very fortunate around the world during these shutdown periods of our showrooms to actually sell pianos, if you want to say, online, mm -hmm. which is something I never thought would be possible. And it's because of the power of the brand, the integrity, the legacy, the, just the, the overall honesty of what Steinway represents to everyone in the world. This, it's around the world, it's synonymous, that they feel so comfortable. Plus, we have this wonderful new opportunity for Steinway pianos called Spirio. Mm. And it is the world's first high-resolution player piano that comes seamlessly built into a Steinway piano. And what this is, has done during this pandemic is it's created a home entertainment system for those individuals who don't play the piano, mm -hmm. who want great quality of sound, they want great music. And with the touch swipe of an iPad, you have the world's finest Steinway artist entertaining you in your home. Right. And while we are initially surprised that this was something that customers would purchase without seeing, now it's become rather sort of normal for, for a customer to say, please send one out. And mm. it's because of the Steinway brand and because of the wonderful Steinway artists like Long Long and Yuja that have made this purchase so seamless from afar. Good news, certainly. There are different levels of uh, uh, pianos uh, produced, uh, manufactured by Steinways and Sons. How do you see the different uh, levels of market and, and how do you see uh, the overall approach and changing of the market in different places including here in China? Well we do we have three different brands of pianos. The Steinway brand is built only in New York and Hamburg factories. Mm -hmm. Then we have Boston piano and we have the Essex piano and those are premium instruments within their price category and they're built on what we call an OEM basis. They are Steinway designs, they're proprietary designs and what they do is provide a customer not quite yet ready for their Steinway piano, an introduction to the family of Steinway design pianos. 
And these instruments, whether it be a Boston or an Essex, are more widely available because of their price range. Right. But it's very interesting because they are guaranteed by Steinway. They are delivered by the same people that deliver Steinways. The technicians are the same technicians that take care of them, that take care of Steinway pianos. So there's a lot of Steinway in each of these two brands. But because the price is, is a more entry-level price on some, it enables a much larger group of consumers to experience a Steinway product. And then we hope, and many have, they trade up to a Steinway grand piano uh, in a few years after they have had the introduction to a Steinway product. Mm. Music will be a big help in that regard. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Lossby. you, a delight to talk with you. Yeah. President and CEO of Steinways and Sons. Thank you. The enthusiasm for classical music, music to the years of piano makers like Steinway and Sons. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.